Hello, welcome back to another episode of Collider Jedi Council. I'm Christian Harloff, a.k.a. Darth Harloff, and guess what? This is the show where we talk about Star Wars. Um, I am very excited today because we have the full council. Uh, oh, wait. wait. We have Mark 2 d 2 here. And I'm getting a little emotional, and I'll got? tell you why. What do you got? This might be the last episode of Jedi Council that you do? where we haven't seen two and a half more footage, minutes of footage. Of Star Wars. You're absolutely right. and that's I can't gonna, handle myself. No, you're right. Um, it is Mark Ellis, and he is here to join me today. Campy is out today, but he will be back next week, and we may have some more guests coming. We do actually have some really cool guests coming up next week. I believe Greg Weissman, who is writing the Kanan comic and also was the one of the originators of Rebels, a TV show. That We'll talk about that as well. We'll talk to him about that next week. That's next week. Uh, but, Mark, first thing we talk about here on the show is simply Star Wars movie news. Everything going on in the world of the cinema. What's happening in Star Wars anthology, saga, anything that we're hearing, we're talking about it. Mark, what do you got? Well, it is movie news, but we're going to talk trailers first. Our good friends over at Star Wars 7 News. Wait, I'm getting no. They have actually, now it's Star Wars News Net.com. Star Wars 7 News, who's given us so many great stories over the last few months, and they're a great aggregator, and they break their own scoops as well, is now known as Star Wars News Net.com. And I think that's such a smart move for them, because probably I think when they started it, um, they were it was like, okay, let's just, everything coming out with Star Wars 7 News. And they're like, well, wait a minute, we're getting everything. There's tons of movies they coming out. They report on all, all of it, the toys, the comics, the games. So Star Wars News Net.com made a lot of sense to do. So I'm glad those guys are the best. And um, they actually reported this trailer thing dropping on Monday the 19th, weeks like like 10 days ago. And I know a lot of people have been picking up and running with it and saying that other sites dropped it first, but credit where credit is due, Star Wars News Net dropped it about 10 days ago. Star Wars News Net reported it first, and then it was backed up by those handsome fellows over at Schmoes No. I've heard of them. That on Monday, October 19th, we will all get to witness the new Star Wars The Force Awakens trailer that J.J. Abrams mentioned at San Diego Comic-Con. It's going to be coming out sometime in the fall. This is right smack dab in the middle of fall. People are percolating, and it's also interesting to note that the tickets for the movie might go on pre right around that same date. So, Christian, what are your plans for Monday, October 19th? Well, I don't know because I don't know what time it's dropping. <laughs> and I think that part of our report for Schmoes was the fact that they, they're going to co confirm it on Sunday. And then I think like three four days after we reported that, other sites were saying that, yes, Sunday, it looks like there's going to be an announcement. There'll be an official announcement as far as that it's coming out on Monday. And you'll probably get the time. Now, some people have rumored that it might come out uh, during football that night because it's ABC. Um, I saw that tweet as well. I mean, I, I was speculating ESPN. that maybe you'd get some sort of TV spot even on Sunday to surprise people during a football game, maybe Sunday night football. But then a, a few fans tweeted us and said, well, you know, the mouse also owns ABC and ESPN. That's what Monday Night Football is on. So maybe you get the trailer in the morning, and then there is a TV spot for Monday Night Football that night to reaffirm it because tickets will be on sale. I think we can agree on that. Tickets are going to be on sale. Sales. Yes. By the time the trailer hits or the end of the trailer, it's just, oh, by the way, click here or go here so yeah. you can buy your tickets. For me personally, I think it would make more sense for them to drop it in the morning. I'd love that. I think around like 7, 8 a.m. our time because then East Coast gets it right around the same time. I think people uh, around the world can get it a little earlier as well. Um, I it doesn't matter either way because people are going to watch it, whether they're, they're, they're waking up and the second they wake up and they know it's out, they're going to watch it. But I just think that it makes a lot of sense for them to do that. Then the tickets go on sale, and then you show it again on Monday Night Football. I'll still have that same reaction uh, that it, if, you're, if you're watching football and, and the, the Force Awakens trailer comes on, even if it's been on the internet for like six hours, it's still going to have the same impact. That's right. It'll make you forget whoever the Giants lost to that Sunday. And I cannot wait to see this thing. Doing? We're going to do a huge – I mean, we're going to do a lot of stuff based around that trailer as mm -hmm. well but as far as the trailer itself october 19th is the date to look for it sure looks like it and and the, it i'm super excited for it now and then by the way it's very possible that once that trailer drops that we will do something for that here we have to mm. talk about it but it, it, it's it's possible that it, there could be a jedi council um special event but we're gonna wait to see what happens on monday all right mark what's next well if uh, one star wars movie isn't enough to satiate your palate how about all seven movies including the force awakens that's what we are speculating because a couple months ago there was a tweet from amc that got recalled initially that said they're going to be doing a star wars marathon and then it was brought to the attention of star wars 
Fandango.com that Fandango has a placeholder page ready for a Star Wars marathon listing that you can see all seven movies, a lot like what they do with the Marvel movies and hopefully what they'll do with the DC movies coming up where fans can go early, like for this instance, it would be Wednesday, December 17th, right? And then you could go and you could enjoy all the movies or the right. 16th or whatever it is and watch them in order and then right up to the to the opening of Force Awakens. Now, something else that this article also says is that Disney is might be kicking around the idea of releasing The Force Awakens a day early here mm, to coincide with the London and French release. Now, that is something that somebody heard at a theater somewhere, so take that with a massive grain of salt, as Star Wars News, Net.com has told us. But, Christian, what do you think about the marathon and then maybe them moving it up? Well, first of all, the marathon goes, I think this is a no-brainer. We talked about sure. this. And like, like you said, you mentioned as far as the Marvel goes, that they've done this with Marvel, and Marvel certainly has a lot more films than just six, um, and they were able to, to do it. Um, and successfully. So, and I think that Star Wars fans would be disappointed if they didn't do this. And I think that for me, um, I would want to do, and I, I honestly too, and, and I'm not just, I you know you're waiting for me to go, I'm just going to see the original trilogy. I was going to uh, ask what time are you showing up to the marathon? <laughs> I, I, you know, listen, if I had, if I had the time to do it all, I would do all of them. I do all seven of them because I do think that what they're going to do is that they're going to tie in some of the stuff that happened in the prequels and the history regardless of what even if they're prequel haters out there too you can't get away from the fact that the prequels are a part of the history it's part of the timeline it's part of the canon and it and it may or may not I mean there's just rumors of Hayden Christensen stuff in, in episode 8 the history and the timeline might play a factor. So I think it's it's good for people to watch originals, and, and they are really good-looking movies, too, the prequels as far as CGI. and They sound the, good in the theater. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it's it's still they're still fun, and I think that they'll get better as they go along. Because I, I think that they do. Like, you start with episode one and two, you can, you can argue, but three is significantly better than those two, and then four, five, and six, and then you're ready for Force Awakens. So I think the, the marathon itself is a smart idea. In regards to the one day earlier for us, I think that's really smart, not only because I'm selfish and want us to get it at the same time as everyone else, <laughs> but because it's you're you're eliminating spoilers and you're eliminating people getting upset about spoilers because if we don't get into a press screening, there's 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 word that we get that it's very limited amount of press screening. So who gets into what? And if that is the case, and let's say that they're they're just like no, you're not. You, you guys are gonna have to go and and you, we're planning on seeing it anywhere when the opening day multiple times, but. If that's the only time, if that's the first time we can see it, I am going to shut off my Twitter. I'm going to shut off, if they don't do this the day before, I'm going to shut everything off because you know people are going to be tweeting at us that have seen it. There are a lot of people out there that like to just spoil to spoil, and they'll be posting things in chat rooms and places. I'm staying away from it, If we, but if we get it the same day, eliminate that chance yeah i mean whatever day it opens i'm gonna go see it the first possible time i can hopefully i can get my tickets on october 19th but that brings up an interesting point is that the tickets go on sale so would they announce a time switch by the time the tickets go on sale or would all the tickets go on sale then everything sells out and then they're like oh you know what we're actually moving it up a day like that seems a, a little call. that seems a little beneath them to me to move the date up a day after everybody's already bought their after tickets because people right. who were buying their tickets for like Thursday at midnight right. thinking they're getting the very first right. show, then all of a sudden you bamboozle them and they don't That's now. That's a great now, point. Now, now they're seeing it a day late than some of their friends who are maybe too lazy to get up yeah. on the 19th to get tickets. I don't think that's the right play. As far as the marathon goes, I'm showing up late to watch the original trilogy, not because I hate the prequels. There's, there's multiple redeemable values about each one of those films. I just know that 15 hours of content a is lot. a lot That's to a sit lot. through. Yeah. Leading up to the Force Awakens, I want to be rested. You're going to watch, be watch go. the original trilogy, though? Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen the original trilogy in a theater in right. a long effing time, man. I was able to, I saw Empire, um, and Kirshner was there before he had passed, and he, and he did like a Q&A afterwards. It was... That at, sounds awesome. It was pretty awesome at the Arclight. That was, that was I, I think that was the last time I saw Empire, and that was probably... Maybe seven, eight years ago. So, yeah, I mean, um, it's something I want to see in a theater and gear up. But, I mean, especially, you know what I'd actually prefer to do is see Jedi and then go into... Because Jedi, I mean, this is yeah. continuing Jedi, right. and I know so... I mean, I've seen all the movies a thousand times, but seeing Jedi in the theater going into Force Awakens would be a pretty sweet deal. What versions are they showing of the original trilogy? It's got to be special edition. You think so? got to be special edition. It would blow the world... It would set the world on fire if, if they were the didn't. original cut. I know. I can't imagine they put that deal together, especially it's it's like a month after they release the Steelbooks on Blu-ray, right. which is still the special well, edition. Well, sure, Disney doesn't own those versions of the movies, too. I don't think. I think Fox owns the theatrical c cuts. Yeah, and, and, and look, look, the mouse really likes his money, so why would you show the original editions when you know you can re-release those in theaters right. two years down the road when they come out on Blu-ray yeah. and make another huge buck there? All right, what's next? 
Uh, J.J. Abrams is talking about Final Cut and his relationship with Disney. This is actually a movie that the panel talked about on Collider Movie Talk earlier this week, and I can't wait to get your thoughts on this because J.J. said some interesting stuff. He talked about how good his relationship with the Disney brass like Bob Iger and Alan Horn is, and then he also dropped it. He technically, according to the contract that he signed with Disney, has Final Cut on The Force Awakens. So my question to you is two-pronged. Is, is everything cool in Disneyland? And more importantly, does J.J. Abrams have Final Cut? Or is it a collective? Does Kathleen Kennedy? Hell, does George Lucas have Final Cut? What's the answer, Chris? The answer is Bob Iger has found a way that they they <laughs> have a Final Cut if, if needed. And J.J. even kind of alluded to that, to where it's like, they're, the, yes, he has Final Cut, but there is a way around it. Like, if they don't like what he's done, which doesn't seem to be the case at all right, right. now, we're not hearing that. But let's say... Again, I hate to bring it up again, but like the Josh Trank Fantastic Four thing. Like if it went down to that and, and, and they were really unhappy with the cut, they could as a studio go in there and then just move it along and, and do whatever they want to it. But that's why Disney is as successful as it is, is they don't have to do that with their filmmakers right now. They haven't had to do that with anyone in Marvel. They haven't had to do that with their the Kenneth Branagh and Cinderella. They, they haven't had to do that right now because they're they're getting the right they have a good collaborative uh relationship with their filmmakers and it and it really is i don't even think it's a matter i think that bob Iger and alan horn at disney are just kind of like when you need us let us know you know here's here are our suggestions here's what we got for whatever you need kathleen jj here's the ball run and when you have i think that it's kathleen and jj really running the show over there i think it's a great collective and i had the opportunity to go up to pixar a few months ago and eat all of their cookies and see how those movies come together and one of the things that really struck me is how collaborative that process is and i think it's going to be the same way with disney's live action slate particularly with star wars because at pixar it's not usually pixar has multiple directors anyway that are titled directors here that's not the case but it's a bunch of people in a room producers directors going over things and everybody agreeing on what the next step should be in the story. So I think that that is going to bleed over into what Star Wars does, and it's the right move. I mean, first of all, just from a pressure standpoint, how can you put all of this on just one person's right. shoulders? It's so nice to sit in a room with a bunch of smart people who are all like-minded, who want the same goal, and Abraham Lincoln this thing. Right. Let's all talk about this stuff, let's get it going, and let's agree on something before the movie comes out. That's what I think everybody has final cut together. If it came down to something, it might be what JJ's talking about in that contract where, where a lawyer could drive a truck through the loophole right. Yeah. <laughs> Who, who, if it went to litigation, who would actually have final cut? Maybe it's JJ, maybe it's Iger. I don't think we're ever going to have to worry about that, at least with this movie. Yeah, I don't think so at all. I agree with you. And I also think that's funny, though. You mentioned that, how collaborative it is. And I think that that's what's going to benefit these movies. And I think that that's one of the things that I think that hurt the prequels in, was that George Lucas didn't need to listen to anybody. He just didn't. He didn't, he didn't want to, and that wasn't his goal. His goal was to really further this technology and to further what ILM was doing, and, and he succeeded in that aspect. And, he, and his vision was to make more kid-friendly movies, and I think he succeeded in that aspect as well, too. Even though if it's not the version that you and I wanted, it's the version he wanted, but it was, certainly wasn't a collaborative effort. It wasn't. It was... And, and people were afraid to tell George no. And it wasn't like back in the day when Brian De Palma and, and Coppola were telling him, hey, dude, that's stupid. Move that over and do that. Uh, <laughs> it's literally what they would say to him. Yeah. Um, but he didn't have that. He didn't, he didn't have Kurtz anymore. You know, he didn't, he didn't have Kasdan. He, had, he was just as him. Um, and I think that he needed more of a collective. If we wanted the, the more closer to what we're getting here and what we had with the original trilogy. But... I think that's what we got now. Yeah, fun fact, Lucas actually didn't have Final Cut on the prequels. He had unlimited power. No! <laughs> All right, what's next? We love Star Wars. Uh, the next story circles around someone who might have Final Cut on The Force Awakens, Kathleen Kennedy. She was interviewed recently and quoted as saying that the new female character in The Force Awakens will be extremely significant to the plot, and this is in an interview where she called on the industry to do more to promote women. Now, Kathleen Kennedy has been famous for the last year saying how prominent the role of females are going to be in the new trilogy, and when talking about this character in particular, Ray, it's going to be extremely significant. Christian, do you read anything into these very limited comments we got? Yes, I read in that she's Ray Skywalker. <laughs> that's that's, that, that seems like you're jumping to a conclusion no, a little bit. She's Ray Skywalker. That's exactly who she is, right. and, I, and, I'm, and I'm happy to say it. I think that's exactly who she's going to be. 100%. I won't go to 100%, but I'll definitely say it's, it's a pretty good uh, chance that she is. And I think that that's kind of one of the things that Kathleen Kennedy's alluding to without necessarily saying it. Um, and I also think that it's, it's, it's a – what I like about it, I'm all for, um, you know, equal equality all the way around when it comes to the parts in 
in movies. Um, I also want to make sure that it's right for the movies, though. It's also for the party, like not just for political correctness. Like I, I think, and I don't think that that's the case with these movies. I really don't. I think that when you look at Captain Phasma, right, and mm-hmm. you say Gwendolyn Christie, all right, great. You, you you look at you look at Game of Thrones and you say, oh, you know she can be powerful. You know she can be strong. You know she can be intimidating. Great. If that's who Captain Phasma is, I'm on board. Um, Ray. She already, from what I've seen, she seems strong. She seems like there, there, there's something to her. There's a mystery to her. There's a, a depth to her. And and they then they cast Daisy Ridley, who seems to be this character, and she's in the in the forefront here. They're doing this with other characters in the canon as well too, with Ray Sloan, and it fits and it's working and it's it's a way for them to, it, I you know, it's bravo to them for introducing more women into Star Wars, but not just saying we need more women, so let's just put them there. It fits. It works. It's like what Claudia Gray, another woman who's writing Star Wars, right? What Claudia Gray did in Lost Stars by putting people in there organically, I think that's what Star Wars is doing with their women characters. That's right. And and you talk, you brought up Gwendolyn Christie as Captain Christie, and then did I say Christie? You said Christie. Is it Elmer Fudd? Everybody's laughing. Is that like a <laughs> is that is that a thing I have? Gwendolyn Christie. Uh, Gwendolyn Christie. <laughs> Dinosaurs. You wabbit. G C is playing Captain Phasma. Then you also have Lupita Nyong'o. We're not sure what kind of alien she's playing. If that's female or not. But we've seen them play strong females on screen before. Then the addition of Daisy Ridley. This is I think that female's going to knock it out of the park. And I'm not willing to say. Do you think she is hot? And Leia's daughter, or do you think she's Luke's? Luke's. You think it's Luke's daughter, yeah. and you're willing to bet a fair amount of money on that? Yes, George Bush, I am. I think that at some point, somebody related to Skywalker's will be on screen in Force Awakens. I'm not ready to say who I definitively think that is, but if you look at the lineage of Star Wars, it's the Skywalker, Skywalker story. story yeah, so. for sure. And I think that Kathleen Kennedy, that's the thing. Kathleen Kennedy is very aware of that. Mm-hmm. And Kathleen Kennedy, remember that article that came out? A few months ago, when they were talking about how JJ got brought to the table, and when JJ, when she she spoke to JJ, she said, "Aren't you curious what happened to Luke Skywalker?" Aren't you? I mean, like she knows, like it's it's the sky, like you said, it's the Skywalker story. This is part of the story. I think that the Skywalker story is going to continue on into episodes 12, 13, and fourteen when she's in her thirties and forties. You know, it's like. So uh, who knows? We should crap out in the first episode for all I know. But what's uh? You're what's you're next? mispronouncing Miss Kennedy's name. It's Kathleen. Kathleen what, Kennedy. for Kathleen Apollo. Kennedy. All right. What's yeah. next? Uh, in our last story in movie news, John Boyega is talking a little bit about his character. There's a really cool article where he mentioned working with JJ and how him and JJ had a relationship because JJ Abrams was a fan of uh, John Boyega's work and Attack the Block amongst other things. He also talked about getting to work with Harrison Ford about uh, learning about his career and that uh, and and all these things that a, an older actor should bestow upon a younger actor. And then Boyega talked about his character Finn a little bit. He described as being in conflict, mostly right. with himself and also with his powers. That Finn is a character with a unique narrative that has never before been seen in a Star Wars universe. And if you think you figured out what that character is, you probably have it wrong. I hope he watches this show because I hope he's talking about us, that we completely have that character pegged wrong so we'll be surprised yeah. in December. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, all I've really he's he has been a mystery to me so far. I mean, I I think we all know to his own confirmation that he's a stormtrooper that kind of goes rogue. Um, we know that he meets up with Daisy Ridley, and and it looks like she that's in a first, that's like the first. 10, 15 minutes of the movie. And we also know that he is either the proud owner or borrowing somebody's lightsaber well, at some got, point in Anakin's this movie. Original a very lightsaber. special lightsaber. Yeah, right? it looks like... Now, the, the rumors that we had heard recently... I don't know if we talked about it on this show, but... um. The, there was a rumor floating around that, that perhaps stormtroopers were, were have been trained in the art of lightsabers. It makes sense to me. It does too. As, as far as where they, how long they've had these lightsabers for, if they're able to keep them activated and they could train the stormtroopers on them he's still going to get his ass kicked I, I assume by someone who knows how to use a lightsaber properly i mean if if it was him versus kylo ren like assume. was teasing that instagram trailer right i gotta put my money on kylo ren maybe we don't know how well kylo ren's been trained either though oh he looks pretty good with that cross i think he probably is but we don't we don't know but as far as what finn's story is there's there is more depth and it's curious as far as like if you haven't if you think you figured it out you haven't there's more depth to him there's more there's more to him and uh, the overall arc 
I would love to know. I want to. I can't wait. I can't wait to learn more. Yeah, what struck me is when he when he talked about conflict and how the character is in conflict mostly with himself. I mean, that just that reeks of Star Wars. You know, when yeah. you, if you're talking about somebody like Luke Skywalker, who he, he's like, look, I just want to be a I just want to be a moisture farmer until I can go to the academy. Then he had to go into this larger world and he had to learn about the Force to rescue a princess and then go on to other missions and learning about the dark side versus the light and being tempted by the dark side. Yeah. That is so what this what is going to happen to this character, not just in this movie. But in the entire trilogy, I don't think I'm wrong about that one, Mr. Boyega. No, you know it's funny too. You said you just said it's classic Star Wars as far as conflict. Like even mm-hmm. even Vader is just like there is no conflict. Yeah. yeah, there is. Don't lie to yourself. Um, there's total conflict. I love that you brought that up too because it conflict. is conflict. Conflict. I want to see. Uh, I think he's going to be one of those characters that you remember. I mean, he's going to be iconic. I really do. I think Finn can. I'll go so I'll say he's going to be an iconic character. As Hal Rudding would say, iconic. Iconic? Okay. Uh, <laughs> that is the end of Star Wars news, I believe. All right. Star Wars news is done. Star Wars movie news, excuse me. Um, now we get to our part of the show. It is a Ray, our graphic designer's favorite part of the show. It is. What's the deal with canon? This is all of the stuff that is happening in the world of Star Wars that ultimately ties into the movies. And this is the brand new history. It is the video games, the comics, the novels, anything that ties into the world of the movies. We will talk about it on this show. And there's a ton of stuff that had happened with the canon um, this past week, Mark. What's the deal? Oh, I see that ugly Yankees hat you're wearing. Did you happen to make it back to your home state of New York for Comic-Con? I, you know that's a stupid question because I was with you this week. Oh, man. Well, you missed out because they talked a lot about Star Wars Season 2 of Rebels. Pablo Hidalgo, besides this awesome trailer that just blew everybody away, uh, Pablo Hidalgo also talked about the new season that is going to be 22 episodes long and he also mentioned there's substantially more antagonists in season two yeah. than in season one dave filoni taylor gray ashley Eckstein also came on stage at some point during comic-con and sarah michelle geller received a huge standing ovation when she showed up so christian you saw all the news that came out of new york comic-con regarding rebels what struck you the most well, i was a trailer man the trailer for me it shows the the tone and and again Filoni has been talking about how this is going to be like the Empire Strikes Back of Rebels and and all and and how much character development there's going to be throughout it and we were and I think and by the way it, we're going to talk about this in a second here because Mark's going to give you a little bit of a review of what he thought of the new season because John Campia and I last night had started our Rebels after show and it was the first one was on last night. We'll be doing it every week. So you're going to get little recaps on this show when the episodes are on. Maybe, you know, in five minutes or so. But you get the full half an hour, 45-minute recap from John, myself. And we're going to be adding some new people soon as well. But go on over there. It's on this channel. And if you haven't already checked it out, you should. Because we went into detail on that episode. But what we did, what we did talk about a little bit was Ahsoka. And in that trailer... Mm-hmm when she has the two lightsabers, and they're the white lightsabers, right? And she's going up against these new Inquisitors. We kind of said it's the same thing as when we saw Vader go up against Ezra and Kanan. There were two people who were mismatched, and there's two Inquisitors going up against a Jedi, you know, a seasoned, trained Jedi, and you want her to be like the number one contender. You want her to knock them around so then when she fights Vader, you're like, okay, that's the main event I want to see. She's got two lightsabers, which was alone enough to turn me on. What I loved most was Dave Filoni made some comments about the Inquisitors, and he talked about how they there is some sort of uniform to the Inquisitors, and that they're all, they have the same rank within the Empire, and that it's a little competitive, is that the Inquisitors do not necessarily trust one another, and it's almost like they're junior execs at a law firm when they're all trying to one-up each other for that next step gig. I love that the Inquisitors are competing with each other even as they're trying to hunt down Rebel Scum. Well, I love the mythology of it already because what what they're telling us now is that because what I think a lot of people assumed is that once all the Jedi were killed, then that's the end of the Force. Only the Emperor mm-hmm. and Vader were using the Force, and then oh, Obi Wan's still out there, and then Luke, those are the, and, and Yoda, those are the only people who use the Force. That was never said. They did definitely said that Jedi were the last of, and and but there were people that still were Force sensitive. And they've been playing with that in the comics and in in Rebels now. And and as far as gathering up these Force-sensitive children, that seems to be the mission of the Emperor and Vader here is to gather all these Force-sensitive kids, turn them into Inquisitors, hunt down any other Force-sensitive people who don't want to turn, and continue the dominance of the Empire. And I love this angle. I think it's great. They're not Sith. 
they're inquisitors, they're force sensitive, and it, it makes sense. Yeah, and it's the first time really in Star Wars because we haven't seen the Force Awakens yet that we've seen somebody who is not eventually going to become a Jedi Knight play around with the Force at all, right? right. I mean, and, and but maybe Boyega's character is that person, or maybe somebody else in the Force Awakens or the new trilogy dabbles in the Force. Maybe we see an inquisitor type person. Maybe that's what Captain Phasma or Kylo Ren is. We have to wait to see all that, but for right now, Rebels is, it seems like it's going to be that thing to satisfy the appetite of a lot of Star Wars fans, yeah. at least until the new movies come out. All right, what's next? Uh, up next, we have the Rebels Episode 1 trailer. Well, no, the actual full review because you've gotten to see more than I have. Yeah. But last night on Disney XD, they aired the first official episode of the new season, not counting the Siege of Lethal that right. was like the 45-minute one. Yeah, in case you were confused about that, um, and then again, Campy and I spoke about this last night, the Siege of Lethal is just... It's it's a TV movie. It's not. It's a great TV movie. Yeah, great TV movie, but it's not part of the 22 episodes that are season two. So, I think that's kind of the answer to when Campia was asking as far as like why did they wait so long to go between that and the next episode? Because the answer is they just put in a movie. That's just a movie they released. The actual season just started last night. Um, so so episode one aired last night. John and I talked about it. I've seen episode two and waiting for John and whoever else is going to join us next week on that show to talk about two. But Mark, you saw episode one last night. Give us a brief uh, review of what you thought, what you liked, what you hope to see more of. Well, what I always look for with Rebels is something that's going to satiate the appetite of somebody like me who wants to see Star Wars and loves Star Wars for the movie. So give me more lore, give me more action. I realize that it's a tough balance because it is an animated show geared towards kids because it's on Disney XD. And so you have to have these really brief moments of intensity on Star Wars before you cut to the next Gorilla Gym commercial. Now, having said all that I think this episode did a fair job of doing that because we got really deep with Kanan and Ezra seeing Rex on screen was awesome I love the Rex storyline I think it's hilarious that old dudes hang out in armor still even though they're not fighting anybody they just sitting around wearing armor for no were, they, were you practicing against each other were you playing laser tag why do you have armor on in the first place it seems like you're just crushing beers watching the game the opening scene of rebels felt a little clunky to me it felt a little exposition heavy where they're just trying to fit a bunch of information in and that didn't come off as well as the rest of the episode but once we got into the meat of this episode i really enjoyed it yeah uh okay so that's mark's thoughts on it if you want to see my thoughts and john's Go watch the recap of Rebels Episode 1, Season 2, last night. We posted it. So go check that out, and we'll be back next week to do that. Mark, what's the next story? Well, uh, Rebels wasn't the only thing to make a Star Wars-y splash at New York Comic Con. We also had a lot of information about the Journey to the Force Awakens. There was a panel that detailed some new books that are going to be coming out in the Journey to the Force Awakens. Christian, I know you love reading. It is fundamental. Which one of these new books strikes you as the one you have to pick up next? I mean, I think people would be shocked if they didn't hear me say Claudia Gray's next novel. I mean, it was funny because I had just spoken to her on this show last week mm -hmm. and she knew she was going to comic con she knew she had the the new republic bloodline it was it was written obviously it comes out in march but she couldn't say anything you know and and she they were going to announce it on at comic con or then it got leaked a couple days later whatever it was um i am thrilled to hear that she is doing a book for del rey because many people might not know this that she that Lost Stars was not part of the Del Rey publishing part. It's, this was the young adult right. novel that was part of Lucasfilm, and then the Del Rey publishing has done the the more adult novels with the you know the Lords of the Sith and Aftermath and things of that nature. And so she's part of that now, and she should be. I think it was really smart for Del Rey to grab her if they didn't already have a deal with her. I think that the fact that she is writing this, this is, and for people wondering, and I'm sure going to get these questions um, soon. She. This is not a sequel to Lost Stars. I don't know if that means that we won't see characters from Lost Stars appear in there, but it's not, it's not a sequel. It takes place six years before The Force Awakens. So it'll Ooh. come out in March. We already have seen The Force Awakens. The question I want to know is, has she seen The Force Awakens? Because for a reference, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, we need to have her back on uh, this show. Seriously, so that's what I want to know. Got some but, questions for you. But she, uh, she, there couldn't, I'm really excited that she, that's that's the book I'm looking forward to. Now, the, the other ones, the... the this one here by the Perfect Weapon, Delilah. This is is that short. based on the uh, Jeff Speakman 1991 action thriller, no, The Perfect it, Weapon? I would love that. But you know, it's funny though, is that she? This is the w the woman in that in that 
the, the, that little behind the scenes thing they showed at Comic Con where they had the woman sitting down on that big uh, kind of troll looking guy. Oh, too. right, right. So that's that. That's her. And then, but it, this is a short story. This isn't a full novel. This is like a short story, story, which I prefer. I think a short story works better for her unless she's going to be this significant character that we want to know more about. Um, now, the other thing that we should talk about here is what I find interesting is that Chuck Wending's Aftermath series, mm-hmm. it's got three books and the second one and the third one were confirmed now these were not critically loved well the first one was aftermath was the first one excuse me aftermath was not loved but the second one is announced and it's called life debt which you assume is about han and chewy especially after that story that the little story that he told in in aftermath what i'm hoping for because i like to consider myself the optimist on on the panel is that i'm hoping that after that life, you're that, the optimist on the panel. Yeah, I think you, so. you think Han Solo is going to die, and you don't well, think we're yeah, going to see Luke Skywalker until the last five minutes. We need a pessimist on the panel. I'm the optimist on the panel. We need a pessimist on the panel. Oh, wait, here we go. <laughs> I used the force, <laughs> I used the force, and I got a pessimist. I'll have on you the know panel. that I am the optimist on this panel. <laughs> Me, <am>. myself. <laughs> John Campy is the optimist on this panel. It's, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to debunk that immediately. I thought you emailed me this morning and said the show was canceled. Uh, I, was, I know you, you, you're a Sith Lord. I can't. Uh, Son I can't, of a. Yeah. So let me let me ask you let me ask you then, Mr. Optimist. Do you think that having Chuck Wending doing all three books is a good idea? Look, Aftermath was a disappointment. It it was. There's no way of getting around it. Um, but it is but one book, right? And I, I confess I haven't read anything else that he's done. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. But am I excited that he's writing two more? No. Yeah. No, I'm not. But I'm not completely abandoning the idea either because it's just one book that I thought didn't work. Well, does it make sense to either one of you boys who have actually read the book now that you know that it, it was part of a trilogy that you're willing to well, forgive it? I, Almost like Quantum of Solace, the Bond movie, where it's like, that eh, it wasn't great, but if it sets up the next one, I'm okay. Well, yes and no. I already knew it was a trilogy because they had announced that okay. a while ago. A while yeah. ago. But... Um, there, there is especially what happens at the end. I do want to know what happens with the characters. I, I didn't hate the book. I, I just was, I was t- completely underwhelmed, and it was very similar to the conversation we had about Robert Rodriguez earlier this morning. Is where just the last thing he did, I wasn't happy with it. But or the last three things, right, right. <laughs> but, but like so, so if but with the case of Wending, it's just been this one thing because like, I'm also not mm. familiar with his work. But with Life Debt, if he knocks this out of the park. He'll get me back on board, and he'll get me very excited for the third one. However, if he ruins Han Solo and Chewie, that's going to be a big... Now, we're just uh-oh. assuming Solo and Chewie life because debt. of the title of it. I'm with you completely. Yeah. If if he crushes life debt, then he's one and one. Yeah. And, in that, and then at that point, we're, okay, everything's good. You know, Then we move on to the third one and see how it goes. Like I said... I'm I'm not excited about the next two because I didn't like the first one, but it is only one book. Right. So I'm not gonna be like how I felt about Die Hard Six earlier today. It's like eh, right. screw this, this right. is terrible. <laughs> right. I'm not gonna be like that. No, he's not time. Skip Woods. No, he's um, not. <laughs> but you know, as no, far, he's not. now how about going back one story real quick because I know that you're loving Lost Stars. How about the yeah. announcement of Claudia Gray doing the New Republic Bloodline six years before The Force Awakens? This is like a rookie. Who an undrafted rookie who gets signed for one game and scores four touchdowns and <laughs> intercepts three balls. He played offense and defense. Yeah, wow. And then the next day they announce, we think we're going to sign this kid on for more. It's just it just makes sense. Right. That seriously, Lost Stars is so good. I'm not yet ready to say I'm not done the book yet. I am not yet ready to say that it's as good as Lords of, Lords of the Sith. Sith. Yeah. I'm not there yet. But I, I'm telling you, I didn't think another one of these novels could usurp. Tarkin as my second favorite, and I do believe it has usurped Tarkin as my second favorite at this point. So I'm very excited by the news. It just makes sense. There would have been something wrong had they not signed her to do more of this because she gets it, she captures it, she fleshes it so well that, like, when I'm either reading, because I pick up, I go back and forth between listening to it and reading it. Mm -hmm. When I'm engaging with that story, I am whisked into Star Wars like nothing else I've read before. And so it's, it just made sense. Well, I think so. We get that. We get her version in March, and then Chuck's uh, Life Debt comes out in July, and then he finishes his trilogy in uh, 2017. And I will say that what I hope that we see from Chuck Wending's next book is that he teases a a character who is similar to um, not Tarkin, but uh, give me the villain in um, Zon Thrawn. 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 So Thrawn 
there's, is on. There's a Thrawn. <laughs> there's a Thrawn-like character that pops up at the end of uh, of Aftermath. Now, whether or not it is, or whether or not it's Snoke, you know, if it's Snoke, then we're going to be able to. I th- assume you would hear more about him because he'll be. You'll learn. Hopefully, learn about some of him in the Force Awakens. So maybe there's more that Chuck's able to do. So I, I am very curious to see where the story goes. I just want a little bit more. All right, Mark. Uh, well, Mark, is there any, any of those things that you're interested in as far as the story goes? I mean, when you say life dead, I, I too rush to thinking about Han Solo and Chewbacca and their relationship and hearing what they're up to in between Return of the Jedi. And The Force Awakens seems what I'm most interested in. Now, if you, I mean, you remember that that was the book. Aftermath was the book that they were pushing the most. It was the, at the forefront of the journey of The Force Awakens was Aftermath. It wasn't as critically well-received as Lost Stars, but I, as a fan, was aware of Aftermath more than I was Lost Stars. Will that be the same thing in 2016, or will we be thinking Bloodline, and then will Life Dead be one of the afterthoughts that you have? So it seems like a lot of characters in these books are going to be contingent on characters that we meet and get to explore in The Force Awakens, which is why it's coming out after The Force Awakens. Right. Okay, what's next? Well, let's take some words in a book and put them with pictures and call it a comic book. We also got some news in that vein coming out of New York Comic Con that there's going to be a Star Wars miniseries comic book called Obi-Wan and Anakin, and it's going to center around the time between the Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, when the two are really going to know each other and get into some adventures. And these, the the particular series is going to be a story about warrior monks ish that's heavily inspired by Lone Wolf and Cub and the samurai films of Akira Kurosawa. Christian, you hear about this? You hear the timeline? Are you jazzed for this? I am actually. I, I'm I'm loving the idea of this, and I think that I want to get a little bit more of what was happening because that's the one time period you don't know a lot about what was going on with Obi-Wan and Anakin in that period you just know that this is when he in the 10 years between Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones that they had a few things and they even mentioned that silly elevator ride on the way up to see Padme the first time in, in Attack of the Clones that there was there's been adventures that they've gone on together, you know, and I want to see what they were. I love the idea that uh, Char- Charles Soule, I believe, who who is doing Lando, which I've really been enjoying. I think that again, repeating ourselves as a guy who knows Star Wars and is writing Star Wars and gets a, a grip of the character. I love the Kurosawa angle mm-hmm. as well, and I think that that cover art is incredible. Um, it, it's it's funny though because I'm getting this. I do get this emotional attachment when I look at Anakin though, just like knowing the, the intent of what George Lucas set up of that you still you know no matter what you think of of Hayden Christian's performances, how whiny he may have been in some of those prequels, and what they did in the Clone Wars, you do feel for Anakin. And when you see him, he's just a kid. You know, he's a kid who's trying to learn and had a rough background and then Obi-Wan who was this wise kind of mentor I want to see where they go so this is a series that I'm very excited for but John not interested but I would love that as a poster on my wall yeah that cover art is beautiful I mean look I shouldn't say I'm not interested at all in in any stories of that time period Uh, but I, I will say that I've never thought man I wish I had some of those stories of that time period I've never really thought about right. it so it does make sense that they're putting out a comic uh, some comics about it and I think there are gonna be people who really do enjoy it and are gonna be glad about it I'm just not one of them, but I, I do love that cover art. I would love to have that on my wall. If I heard about this comic book when I was, you know, in the early 90s and at the height of my comic book collecting career as a kid, I would, I, would be, I, I would be lined up outside the comic book shop waiting to get this thing. As it stands today, I think the biggest bummer to me of the prequels was the relationship between Anakin and Obi-Wan. I just didn't buy that it was like it was set up in the original trilogy at all, that he was a good friend and a great pilot, and, man, I really missed that guy and what happened to him. I didn't get any of that from the prequels and I know this isn't the prequels but those are who are in my head when I think of these guys now well that's a fascinating point there and that's the whole reason why I referenced the Clone Wars series because <clears throat> I agree with you had you and you, you didn't watch the full Clone Wars series and a lot of people out there didn't um, who are Star Wars fans I did I through that series and through what Filoni and Lucas himself did with Anakin and the development of him, I did feel that guy who was the real friend and true friend. So that's kind of why I care, I think, a little bit more because of the development of what happened to him in the Clone Wars series. But I agree, and I have to, I totally get that in the, if you're just basing off the prequels, it's a little tough. Well, at least it looks like they're in a snowy destination and not, God forbid, sand. <laughs> <laughs> What's, it well, gets he, everywhere. He hates sand. <laughs> What's next? Coarse and rough. Uh, you have read another comic book that I want to talk to you about, Shattered Empire issue number three. You've been loving Shattered Empire through two issues. 
The third one, it's yet again. phenomenal. Hat trick. So good. And, and there's only one left. There's only four issues of this, of this comic. Um, this, is, this one's really, I, mean, I have to give a little spoiler here on the, on the issue. So if you don't do want to hear about it, thing when yeah, you're done. I'll, I'll start here yeah. and then, I'll, and then I'll, I'll do one in a little bit. Um, there's something so cool. And I think I told you about this too. Yeah, this, you did. this was something to link, again, linking back to prequels. There's been a little, a little, a little love shown to the prequels here in this, in this uh, episode. There's some great lightsaber fights. Well, I'll tell you what. They go so. Leia goes to Naboo. So Leia is goes with Poe's mother, and then Han's off with Poe's father, and they're, they're they're on separate different adventures during this issue. Leia's out to talk to the government of Naboo, and Naboo is. Still kind of reeling because they know that there's going to be an attack from the remnants of the Empire because the Emperor's plan was always to take back his home world. He demilitarized them uh, a year, like 10 years before. And so Leia's like, we need some ships. We need to be able to fight. And he's like, well, there is this one room that's been shut down for a long time. We can, we can go. And they go into the room, and it's the, it's the hangar from episode one. And, <laughs> cool. they, and they walk in, and they walk through it, and Leia stops in the hallway and she senses it and she senses Darth Maul's presence in that from where he was standing. Yeah. And, yeah. See, and, and like you have and it, it, she's like, I feel cold. And it's like she's using the force. She's using she's able to. And she did it. She did that on Naboo in, in the Leia comic a couple years and years back to where she sensed her mother. So Leia's this. It's, it's interesting because Leia is strong in the force is to where she can. You know, she's it's still raw. But w the question I have for you guys is, do you think. They're gonna address her having the force at all in the Force Awakens. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. Oh yeah, it'll it'll get addressed. I know whether they're gonna address it in the sense that um, you know this is something that was passed on my family, blah, blah blah. But she put it aside. She never. Th I mean, there was too many responsibilities like on the her. Like the Zahn novels. Yes. Yeah. There are too many responsibilities on her now, especially with the fall of the Empire and all that kind of stuff for her to pursue Jedi training. And I think that's always going to be something that's going to be secondary, but it's there. I do think it's going to be present, but I think we're going to find out that through the years and decades, she never actually pursued it. I Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that you're going to see her like move objects in right. The Force Awakens, but we've heard precious little from Luke Skywalker in the press about this upcoming movie. One of the things he did tell us in the trailer was that the Force is strong in my family, and he reminded us that his sister has it too. So we'll see what that means going yeah. forward, but she definitely is going to be... It's gonna, we're all going to be aware that she has the Force. All right, what's next? Uh, let's go to Chewy number one. This was a bit of a question mark comic book where you want to know what kind of adventure Chewie's on. How much dialogue is going to be in here? Is this going to be a picture book with a lot of roars in it? Christian, how do you like Chewy number one? I got to be honest, I didn't like it. Ah, I, it just I, I got I got to go back and I, I kind of bailed on it. Like I just it just was. It, it, I felt like they were trying to set up Chewie to be like Han Solo at one point. He's playing cards, and the, the girl is like needs him to help on an adventure. And I was just like, uh, this. I, it felt like they were reaching. It felt like they like. It, it was the concern that I had. Like Chewie doesn't need a, a full comic. He doesn't need. He doesn't need a full comic at all. And I think that. I have to go back and watch and read it again because I, I it was losing my interest and I was like uh, I was kind of scatterbrained when I was reading it so I'll go back but I I didn't care for it. Do now, you guys have what you, I want to know is yeah. in the last panel does a ship land with a mysterious woman coming out and say I'm Chewbacca's wife. <laughs> if that happens, I'm on board. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of the chipmunks. Actually. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it's it's something. I, if you're reading all the comics and you want to. If you want to check it out, go ahead and and I, and maybe I'll, it'll get better. But right now, I'm, I'm not buying it. Uh, okay, last thing in canon. Uh, well, something that I think we're all buying next month is Star Wars Battlefront, the video game, the beta version, uh, came alive this past week. And Christian, I don't, you did you get to check out the game at all? Yeah, I did. I play. I played for. <laughs> I played for two days. Um, Straight? No, no, no. I played. It, 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 it was funny. I told myself, oh, I'm going to play for an hour, and I was on there for like five. Um, but I played with a bunch of Jedi Council fans, which was really cool. Um, and I and I was terrible. I mean, it was I was terrible. Uh, That's got to be so great for Jedi Council fans just to kick the crap out of the <laughs> I was playing with them all, too. I was like, I'm sorry I couldn't be on your other team. So, I mean, there, were some, there were some on the other team that were just wrecking me, and some of the name, usernames were hysterical. But... Um, <laughs> I uh, and it's funny because a lot of the fans that I was playing with also they there was even one guy and he's just like I've gotten killed so many times because I just keep staring at all the detail like he yeah. himself looking up <laughs> on a mountain and just get shot in the head because it's like 
it's beautiful. It really is. Now, the thing I think with the game, and I think that I, I John, you and I have the same thoughts on Battlefront, is that it, 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 after a while, I think it becomes repetitive, um, the, the game itself, too. But I haven't played the other planets yet. I think that it's definitely, it lends itself, the multiplayer, the playing with fans. It was a fans. very limited beta. It was. Yeah, very, so it was, don't be put no, off by that. No, I'm not. And I, and I, I just, <clears> even when the, the old Battlefront came out, I was more of like a Night Seal Republic guy, the RPG type stuff, than I was Battlefront. Now, other people love Battlefront. I still want to play it. There's so much detail to it, um, and I and I want to play with you guys so we can play against other fans. But are, are you guys super excited for this game? I, I, I think I want to be more excited than I actually am. Mm -hmm. um, now, at first, I was just not interested at all. It just looks like any other first-person shooter game with a Star Wars skin on it. But then I started seeing some other things, whether it's the stuff where you can be like in a snow speeder and actually and all that kind of stuff. I started to get more excited. Unfortunately, because the weekend was so busy, I didn't even get a chance to look right. at Bi Battlefront. I did get a chance to hop online and watch some people play it streaming. Mm. Um, and that was really interesting to What'd see. What did you think of the stream? I was excited. Okay, I mean, cool. I, I was excited. And I remember calling you, yeah. and and uh, I, was, I was talking to him, and I, th th he was interrupted by his daughter saying, Daddy, I'm hungry. And he said, here's $5, <laughs> honey, walk over to McDonald's. You'll get that a lot. He was yeah. very, very yeah. focused, get very out. focused. But yeah, when the funny thing is, when you look at some of these stim still images, you will be tempted, like I was, to think that these are pieces of production art. They're not. The game is this detailed. It is that sharp. It is that high res. It is so gorgeous. So when you were telling me about the one guy about, I was getting, kept getting killed because I just kept looking around. Right. It's like, yeah, that would totally be me. Right. I think the first day that I play this game, that's just going to be, I'm just going to be running around, not shooting anything, just looking at everything. Right. Yeah, I know why you want to play me in the game. Because I was that kid in Goldeneye who just like was running around and didn't know where he was. Uh, and I was three points in Goldeneye. I got my bench. Yeah, terrible sense of direction. I'm great at Halo, though. I'm awesome at Halo. And then this one, I don't know if I'm going to be that good or have the time to be able to invest in being yeah. good. I think you played it the right way, though, talking about the multiplayer. Because that's what sells this game. Yeah. It's like a Guillermo del Toro movie a little bit where you know visually it's going to be spectacular. You're not sure how much you're going to love the story. But being able to play it against other, other human beings... That is what sells Battlefront. Well, I think it's pretty much a guarantee that once we get it, we're going to be playing the three of us together against you guys. So look forward to that. I for don't sure. think you're going to see any movie talk shows for like four or five no, days no, probably when the not. game comes out. No, Ray will be hosting it. Um, <laughs> Ray, Ray's going to be hosting all yeah. the shows. Ray is going to be better than all of us at Battlefront. Probably. He probably will is. be better yeah, than yeah, all of us at Battlefront. Will. All right, that's the end of the <laughs> canon discussion. And now it's time to hear from you guys. Throughout the week, you guys have been sending in your Twitter questions and you've been hashtagging it. Collider Jedi Council. We've been picking them out and we've got some to read. Mark, what's next? Kicking us off is Nate Miller and he says, what should we expect from Leia in The Force Awakens? No one is really talking about her. Well, not until 10 minutes ago. Oh, and you guys rock socks off. Um, I think that I ruined his question by bringing it up before, but I will say, what can we expect from her just from besides the Force is that we know from one of the young reader novels is that she's she is the head commander of the resistance. There is something happening with some kind of grand weapon that she's going after as well, too. Um, and she is still very burdened by this responsibility that she's had over the years. So I think that you're going to see a lot of that. And the fact is, that, you know, she's got her husband, ex-husband, son running around out there. She's our, where the hell's her weirdo brother? Like, nobody knows she's got a lot on her plate so I think that's what you're going to see from Leia but Mark she's going to be a calm dignified presence during a time of crisis like Morgan Freeman in Deep Impact now on her being married to Han or maybe being divorced from Han I I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it's the, the I can't say that they're not together anymore she said I love you he said I know and then they flip-flopped in Return of the Jedi I gotta think a love like that is gonna last 30 years whatever space adventures they went on so Han cheated on you a couple times I think they're still together uh, I don't think they're still together, and I think we're going to see Leia as a very tired, yeah, uh, weary Leia. She, like you mentioned, I don't know if there's anybody in Star Wars that has more on her. The responsibility of the galaxy, her, the fact that she's one of the last surviving Force-sensitive beings in, in the galaxy, right. and a part of the Skywalker lineage. So the Force is probably stronger with her than anybody else in the universe, other than maybe Luke. You have everything, all the drama going on with her husband, whatever that drama is. Um, so I think she's going to be quite a pivotal character in the movie, but tired, 
war war torn weary. I think yeah. that's what we're going to see here. I agree. All right, Mark, what's next? <clears throat> uh, what are your guys' thoughts on seeing this guy appearing in Rogue One? And that's from our boy Colin. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna play the role of John Campia in this one, and I'm gonna say I don't want to see him in Rogue One. I don't think he should be in Rogue One. I think that it's a, like. I think it kind of diminishes episode four a little bit if you see him because he was kind of he's been living as, as a hermit protecting Luke for so long that by the time those plans got sent down, he was thrown back into it. Even the Obi-Wan Kenobi. I haven't heard the that. Obi-Wan. He, he was thrown back into it. And it was just and <clears throat> he's been living this life. So, I mean, if it's a, you know, just a hologram or something. Sure. But as for I, I want to see him in his own anthology film and I want to see him doing you know adventures on Tatooine or somewhere else but th- that that's all I want from Obi-Wan right now even a hologram I think does the same thing what you were talking about where it's like well why was he so surprised this was a strange old hermit that lived out beyond the dune sea and made crazy noises for most of his day what the hell does he know about the Death Star about the plants unless he's totally rope doping Luke and is acting like oh I don't know what the hell this is this is a droid I haven't heard the name Obi-Wan in years which he could do I mean look he straight up lied to Luke on more than one occasion, yeah. so he's he's been known from to from a bend certain the, point of view. He's bended the truth a few times before. Will he be doing that again in Rogue One? I don't think you're going to see him. I think he's definitely going to be referenced, though. You got to think maybe they're looking for Kenobi at the beginning of the movie because he was such an integral part of the prequels. And they're looking for him <laughs> in Rebels. I mean, he's already been referenced in in Siege of Lothal. So we're not going to see him. We're not going to hear about him. There's going to be no references, no holograms, no nothing. It, it Star Wars Celebration. They were very adamant in saying this is a universe without Jedi. Yeah, there. I don't think we're going to have any Jedi presence whatsoever in this film. And that was kind of what you know Ryan was talking about at celebrations. You know, the the galaxy had always had Jedi. This is a new game. Right. There's no Jedi for anybody to rely on. Gareth. Uh, Gareth, yeah. sorry, thank you. Sorry, Ryan, of course, is episode right, eight. Right. Um, there's, no, there's no Jedi here for us to lean on or rely on or to come in and save the day. This is going to be a war film. This is going to be a World War II kind of film. Yep. And I, I really do believe this is going to be our first Star Wars film with absolutely no Jedi. But that's not to say you won't see a Sith. <laughs> that's, no, well, we already know Vader's probably going to pop up. We're probably going to see Vader. How big of a role? Yeah. Who knows? Well, I think that... If showing the success of what I mean, look, it's Vader. You could pretty much guarantee that it's going to be successful with fans. Oh, when sure. Yeah. But but watching the way that they've handled him in Rebels and Kiri Hart, who produces Rebels and part of Lucas uh, film is is it certainly has a say in Rogue One as well, too. And and she's been overseeing the Vader usage. And I think that they'll I think that it, I think they'd be hurting themselves if they don't put Vader in there. Oh, I think you got to have Vader in you there. Quick side it. question. Do you think in the first trailer we get for Rogue One, you're going to he- at least hear Darth Vader breathing? Yes, I do. I I don't think he's going to be a surprise in the. I think they're going to market the movie with him because I think that's how you're going to get fans who are not aware that are not watching Jedi Council or that not or not like huge Star Wars fans. I think that that's how you're going to get casual fans in the theater. Is once you know <laughs> Vader's coming back, that's how you. Yeah, man, you get to see that guy in his prime again. Absolutely not. We're you not going to see so? Vader in that first trailer. Why? Because it's going to be the same. Now I agree with you. By the time that film comes around. Vader will play a prominent role in the marketing campaign yeah. of Rogue One. But much like the first trailer for The Force Awakens, where we saw no Luke, we oh, right, saw no right, Leia, right. we saw no Han. The fir- Remember, we're just talking about the first trailer. By the time you get to the second trailer, though, and all of a sudden a door opens and there's the Lord of the Sith standing behind <laughs> right. that door, people like us are going to lose our minds. I, I don't disagree with you at all. There. I, I was talking about as far as just popping up in a trailer in general. Um, oh, and, yeah, as, absolutely. As far as the first trailer, no, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not in it at all, but I think that they will use him in the marketing absolutely. campaign. Absolutely. I just want to hear some. Just, just breathe for me once. It would be great. <laughs> not, not you, oh, Darth sorry. Vader. All right, what's next? Uh, Tim Van Nuen writes, do you guys think The Force Awakens will get a prologue a la Lord of the Rings or do you think that the crawl will have enough info for the new fans? It's a great question. Um, <laughs> That's an excellent question. I love that question. And I, I, I would actually love to see a prologue of a little bit of what's been going in on the days following the destruction of the second right. Death previously, Star. On, previously on right that's that's what i that i'd like to see it but i think that they're going to stay traditional and they're going to go with the crawl Mark. there's no way in hell you're getting a pro no. one even if you wanted one it's not going to happen it's another movie they could make 10 years down the road you're going to get it in the crawl text it's going to be very traditional star wars yeah. that you're not getting anything you might get a flashback in the movie somewhere but i don't think you're getting a prologue i already don't know how i'm going to handle it without the fox intro right i just don't know how i'm going to i'm like what wait what right. that's going to be me then if they don't do it with the crawl i'll totally lose my mind so they're going with the crawl yeah you say no it's an interesting idea it really is and uh, look trust me if they actually did something like that 
I am not going to be totally opposed to it. It'll take a second for my mind to switch gears. I'd be gears. okay with it. I, I, I'd be okay with I, it. It would be a nice history lesson. But I agree with you. I yeah. don't think they're actually going to do but it. But it's also Disney. They want you to buy the books, and they want you. To, they want to make as well, many movies as they can. They want you to buy the that's, books. That's too. a way to sell the books, though. I'll tell you, though. If they were, if they wanted to do it that way, they show a really cool scene from that time, and they're like, hey, you want to learn more about how what really happened there? Go buy you know the what book. What they should do at some point, they should have Poe like break the fourth wall. They're talking about something <laughs> to find out more about how I came here. Right. Read so and so, and then turn back. <laughs> Into the scene. Him and Ferris Bueller have a new movie. Together. All right, what's what's uh, what's next? Uh, Dusty Pearson writes with all the systems and planets mentioned in the Star Wars universe. Do you think we'll ever hear Solar System or Earth? I'm just gonna let you take this. I sure hope not. I sure hope not, and I will say absolutely <laughs> not because what's the first thing you see? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, 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 away. far away. So I assume that the dinosaurs haven't even been still here. in the universe, though. But I know, but I don't even think that dinosaurs have been around yet by the t- by w- when it's happening in this timeline. I don't even know if humans even exist on Earth by the time what Star Wars is going on. But you got to understand too, George Lucas at first, especially when you go back and read uh, the book we always reference here, uh, "How Star Wars Conquered the Universe." I cannot emphasize enough that you got to read this book, but. When Lucas was setting this up, he was basically telling a story. It's like when a dad is telling his daughter a story of a princess, he was like, uh, uh, once upon a time in a land far, far away, there was a princess in a magical castle with a dragon. He's not telling his daughter, yes, somewhere just west of uh, this European country, this is where this actually, no. When Lucas and Star Wars start off with a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, that's basically then them saying the same thing. It's once upon a time. This isn't our universe. This isn't our world. We're never going to see Earth in it. This isn't Battlestar Galactica, right. where it was always meant to be in the same galaxy. This is this is something. This is science fiction. This is fantasy. At the same time, this is a space opera. This is not our universe. We're never going to see Earth. Interesting fact, though, the first draft <laughs> of Star Wars took place in Cincinnati. I uh, I forgot about that. Oh, all right, nice try. Uh, what, <laughs> you guys what? don't want to have any fun, do you? Okay, let's just go through the Twitter questions. <laughs> Jesus, one Christ. of these days he's got to say something. We just got to go with it and create a story. What online. do you think? You think Earth's going to happen? No, but no. if you want to see that happen, it actually did. You can watch Patton Oswalt's filibuster on Parks and Rec. It might be the greatest nine minutes in the history of anything. <laughs> well, that's why when people always ask if there's going to be a crossover between like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and Star Wars now because Disney, and I say no, it'll never happen no, no. because again, just remember a long time ago. A long time ago. That's that's what you should remember. In a galaxy far, far it's away. Not quite as long. Thirty years ahead. And, uh, it's not thirty. It's, it's, it's now we're thirty years ahead of the original long time ago. Well, no. And, and I don't even think it's it's a literal long time ago. Like I said, I think it's a the same text of Dad saying once upon a time in a magical yeah. kingdom. It's it's not our world. It's right. something totally different. All right. What's next? Uh, Nico Lazar Strizapak. I did the best I could. What story from the Legends era would you like to be adapted to the big or a small screen? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with what Legends means, like so, all the you know, John and I just mentioned before, Timothy Zahn and the and the Thrawn trilogy. These were the books and like comics and stuff that came out after Return of the Jedi, and that what really was a source of, of Star Wars entertainment for the fans. And when Disney bought over Lucas, all the publications and all the comics and games and everything um, didn't, didn't really count anymore in the timeline. And, and it really never did. Lucas never really confirmed that it was actual canon. Um, I know that there's some people out there who argue that it did, but from everything I've read, Lucas never really considered it part of the timeline. So there were some great stories out there that happened, some really phenomenal ones like we mentioned with with Timothy Zahn's novels. But for me, I think that obviously I don't have a dollar to put in there, but the James Lucino, Darth Plagueis novel, I I still have like some kind of fanboy hope that if he's ever introduced in the movies that they actually go and take that Legends label off of it and stick the uh, canon label on it. I hope that that's a phenomenal book. And the Darth Bane trilogy by Drew Carpetian. Those are my (laughs) favorite books the, the Darth Bane is takes place in the Old Republic about a thousand years before episode four and it is the absolute it, it is it just really paints what Sith history and, and the, the, the the mindset behind the dark side is I love it um, besides the obvious one which is of course the Timothy Zahn uh, Thrawn trilogy I'm gonna go a little bit more obscure but I'm gonna really highly recommend if you have a chance and a few hours to kill do some digging around online look up these stories it's not even a book 
All right, this is from the Star Wars role-playing game by West End Games, okay? They put out an expansion pack called Lords of the Expanse, and they basically created a new level for Lord. Now, you got your core worlds, mid, mid rim, outer rim, but beyond the outer rim is something they created called the Expanse. And the Expanse is a series of worlds way so far out there that the Empire couldn't exercise direct control over them. And what they had in the Expanse worlds is a caste system of nobles, and regular people. So you have dukes and counts and all that kind of stuff. And you have these noble houses that rule different things and the houses are at war with each other. The empire has a presence there with governors and things like that. But the stories you could tell in a setting like that of the expanse with noble houses and imperial presence, but they kind of let the nobles do what they want to do. They pay their tariffs back to the empire, so the empire is cool, whatever. The stories you could tell there it would make a great Netflix series, even though I don't want Star Wars on Netflix. But um, if you could do those, those would be the ones. So I highly encourage you, look up Lords of the Expanse, and you're going to find some some great, rich storytelling uh, stuff there that you could use. And huh? we could put our solar system in the Expanse, right? That's where Earth could <laughs> be. Earth, it's, yes. Their Expanse is our Earth. I would say that there's one character in the, in the six movies that just didn't quite get its credit on screen. Sorry, not talking about you, Wedge Antilles. I'm talking about Darth Maul. Like, it was such a cool character I'd like to explore and so some I know he's in a couple Legends books like Shadowhunter or The Wrath of Darth Maul I want to see another story with Darth Maul I want to see him on screen one more time I don't think it's ever going to happen but it'd be cool what I, was, what was, which was the book where Darth Maul was sent uh, by the Emperor to take down the crime syndicate to take down the sun I think that's, um, the dark sun was that Shadowhunter I think was that Shadowhunter Shadow Shadow okay. I think so but but I <laughs> actually disagree with you I think you are going to see him again in the movies I think that especially if you do a, uh, an Obi-Wan movie I think he's going to pop back up like, like the new Darth Maul the after he got the yeah, because he he's he's he, they still don't know what happened to him. I mean, he he sort of well, he got cut in half. Is no, what happened? But to him. Clone Wars, he came back in Clone Wars. Okay, yeah. that's canon. That's canon. All right. So, all right, what's next? Uh, fan, or I guess it's pronounced Fawn Solo, writes, With all the hype surrounding Episode 7, are we setting ourselves up for an Episode 1 level of disappointment? I'll let, John, I'll let John start with this one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we totally are. I mean, but that's the risk. It's like love, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. You put your heart out there. You risk being crushed. It's absolutely a possibility. <laughs> she, she or he may turn out to be just a it. dirty, rotten person <laughs> and then crush you and you end up hurt and crying and eating gallons of ice cream and watching Maury and all that. Kind of, that's absolutely <laughs> sure. We are setting ourselves up for that. Absolutely. But like love, you trust that, hey, maybe, just maybe, it's going to turn out to be the most rich, fulfilling experience of our lives. Mm. So I'm Trusting it's going to be that, but in having that trust, we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. So it's it's love, baby. It's just love. You're so right, though. But you know, <laughs> when when you look at it, you go, no, it's not good. You, we are, we are. I mean, it's it's. I don't think. I think that we're all going to walk out, and I think that we're most likely. You think we're going to walk out? We're going to. Well, we'll, yeah, right. <laughs> Done. I, we're out. Forget this movie. Um, but most likely, the three of us will be seeing this movie together. And probably when, when we're leaving i'm i just i'm painting both pictures in my head the one that i want and the one i'm terrified of the one that i want obviously is us just <laughs> skipping looking, hugging we're probably gonna hug at the oh, end yeah. of it and go yes we're back it's it, it, nothing will ever be better no, than this moment no, it's gonna be like stand by me um but but then there's, there's this, a dead body in the movie <laughs> <laughs> maybe but then there's this terrifying terrifying <laughs> vision of just us looking at each other like, no, what it it happened again? What? Why? No! <laughs> you know, it, it, and it certainly has to be in there. I just I just feel again going back to the conversation mark that you and I just had about the collective storytelling and what they know and Bob Iger man, the fact that what Bob Iger knows what this means and Kathleen Kennedy and J J Abrams. We're just in good hands right now. Why is Kylo Ren singing Teen Spirit? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Pan up in this mother. I think that you're setting yourself up for a level of greater disappointment than episode yeah. one because mm -hmm. even though the three of us might be emotionally callous enough to be like, ah, it's okay, it's not because episode one was coming out and we just wanted to see 
this next Star Wars movie. And we knew there was a trilogy. And, oh, man, I hope this entire trilogy is great. There's so much more in the Star Wars universe now. There's TV shows. And there's all these books that are coming out that are officially canon. And we don't just have a new trilogy. We have a bunch of other standalone anthologies that are coming out for the rest of the time. So if this movie isn't good, it's got a lot more burden to put on its shoulders yeah. than even Phantom <laughs> Menace did. So we're actually setting ourselves up for a level of much greater disappointment. I don't think that is going to come to pass. I think the movie is going to be phenomenal. But, John, you referenced love. And I, I hate to break it to well, you. Star Wars is bigger than love, my friend. It's true. Well, let me. Here's another question. It's hypothetical. As far as so, let's say, let's say that is it, is it more pressure on Ryan Johnson's shoulders, if Force Awakens is better than Empire, or if it's worse than Phantom Menace? No, actually, I think it takes some of the pressure off. If it's better, yeah, I think I think it's well. First, let's not let's not put too big expectations on this and being bad. I mean, it just I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying what like, I think if it's like the greatest thing. thing, it's like if it's the greatest sci-fi film of all time. You don't think that's more pressure on Ryan Johnson's shoulders? I think I think in one sense when you understand the pressure that the that Star Wars is facing right now because it's a mixture there it is a mixture of excitement but trepidation at the same time because of what the prequels did. Right. And I think if JJ can come out whether it just be really good or one of the greatest sci-fi films of all time, I think it removes that pressure, that burden of people coming in with a skeptical mind. Mm -hmm. Because as, as excited as we all are about the, the Force Awakens, we all of us, a part of us is walking with a little bit of skepticism. Sure. And, and that's gotta be there. And I think an excellent Force Awakens can alleviate that. Now, with that being said, there does come pressure following up a great film. Any In any franchise, you're following up a great film. Whoever's got to direct the next Avengers, whoever's got to direct the next whatever, there is that pressure that will come right. with it. But I believe the significance of that pressure is less significant than the pressure of the skepticism that's right. going to be removed. So overall, I think it's going to lessen the pressure. You what, need to get a win. Well, you need, you need yeah, to get you need a, a win. win with Episode Seven. You need to prove that Star Wars can be great movies in the modern age. After that comes out, Episode Eight. If it's just as good or it's not as good, that's okay because we still believe that we, like we've seen it done recently, so we can do it again with Episode Nine. It has nowhere near the pressure, even if Episode Seven's great, that the Force Awakens has. Well, that's it. what I'm saying. That so, if if and I hate to even put this on the table, if Episode Seven is let's say it's terrible, right? How much pressure then is on Ryan Johnson's shoulders then? Unbelievable, yeah. unbelievable. Because be that franchise. seed of pessimism yeah. is. Prove it, buddy. That like it, it goes from a seed to a full-grown poisonous oak. Yeah. That it's it, man. The pressure that will be on Ryan Johnson, that will be on um, uh, any of the other directors right. in the film, whether it's Episode Nine, whether it's Rogue One, the pressure then goes through the roof. Right. Well, Trevorrow is going to have pressure no matter what, because especially <laughs> if you have if if Episode Seven is incredible and Episode Eight delivers. Episode nine is going to be like, what do you got? What do you got? What do yeah, you got? If yeah. he doesn't, if he, it's that, that is tough to have all three directors. You know, who's going to have tons of pressure is whoever's making the movie where, God forbid, a Skywalker bites the dust. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure. I mean, it's going to be sad if Han or Chewie or any of them go, but <laughs> if you have to kill off Luke Skywalker, or Leia. that is a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That is the show for today. I'd like to thank the council. Mark 2D2 himself. Mark, where can they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at 5150 Ellis. This Saturday, I'm headlining at <laughs> Hypno Comics in Ventura, California. The show's called Hypno Comedy. Come on out. I'll be telling a lot of Star Wars jokes. And always the optimist. He made it to the show. It is Obi John Kenobi. John, where can they find you? I don't know why he didn't let me answer any of the first bunch of questions on the show. He just... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, you guys can find me on Facebook and on Twitter simply at John Campia and on all the shows we do here on Collider Video. But specifically right now on our brand new uh, Clyder's Rebels recap show, which airs, of course, on Wednesday evenings. Uh, Christian and I have started up. I'm sure you probably mentioned that a little bit earlier. We're going to be joined by some other cast. That's going to be a surprise. Uh, so, yeah, find us there. Yeah, and make sure you follow me at Christian Harloff on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you keep submitting your questions. Hashtag Collider Jedi Council so we can hopefully get some of your questions on the air. Like I mentioned before, Greg Weissman, who is writing the Canon comic, he will be our guest next week live in studio, which will be um, awesome. I am looking forward to talking to him. Um, and I think that we have a few more exciting guests in the works, but we'll, we'll let you know as it comes. Thank you so much for tuning in. May the Force be with you.